Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 4113, King of Tars, Part 1. I'm hoping that you read up to around line 420 for today and that you'll finish it over the weekend as well as reading Court Whitaker's important article from the Journal of English and Romance Philology. Uh, there's a link to that on the syllabus. What I have here on this first slide is an image from the one of the three surviving manuscripts of this uh, romance. This is a manuscript that's known as the Vernon Manuscript. It's at Oxford. It's manuscript Bodley 3938, folio 304 verso. What does that all mean? Uh, manuscripts are unique objects. They're, they can be produced in a kind of mass-produced way, but every individual surviving medieval manuscript has a unique identifier. So uh, this is telling you where this manuscript is located. It's in England at Oxford University. It's telling you what library it's in, the Bodleian, and then giving you the number. And then when I say folio 304 verso, it means it's on a particular sheet in this manuscript. Verso means it's on the top side and the recto or R, these are Latin terms, means it's on the back side of that particular sheet. When a modern editor wants to take something like this and make it more easily readable for you, a modern person, what they have to do first is determine how many manuscripts there are that contain the text that they're going to edit. And then they have to decide whether they're going to try to combine those various manuscripts into a single authoritative text or whether they're going to choose one manuscript they believe is better than the other ones. Maybe it's the earliest one, who knows? Maybe it's the one that's written by the writer themselves. So here I want to show you a key difference of the Bodleian manuscript from another manuscript. It's in the title of the work that we're reading. We know it as the King of Tars, but here is uh, in rubrication, that is in red, uh, lettering, there is a title from the Bodleian manuscript that says, Here beginneth of the King of Tars and of the Sultan of Damascus, how the Sultan of Damascus was christened through God's grace. So that's not the title of the work we're reading. It is, in fact, the same work, the King of Tars. But when it says, Here begins the King of Tars and of the Sultan of Damascus, it gives them each equal importance. And then it says that it's about the Sultan of Damascus becoming Christian through God's grace, doesn't say anything about bodily transformation or anything about miracles. Um, you might wonder why isn't just this named after the daughter? Well, you can find that that mistake, probably I think of as a mistake, is something that you can find in another manuscript of this text, which is in Scotland, National Library, formerly known as Advocates Library in Edinburgh, uh, manuscript Advocates, that's the name of the previous library, or the library's previous name, 19.2.1, again, unique object identifier, folio 7a. One of the things about the digitization of manuscripts is it makes it much, much easier for people like me to study them. It used to be maybe as recently as 10 years ago, I would have been required to fly to Edinburgh or fly to Oxford in order to look at this manuscript, or I might be able to examine it on a black and white uh, microfilm. Uh, so this is, this is not as good as looking at it in person, but it still makes my life much, much easier if I want to compare works. So this one is simply says, the King of Tars. You'll see that thing looks like it's a line going down with a, a circle in front of it. That might look to you like a P. It's actually an, uh, an obsolete letter form known as a thorn, like every rose has its thorn. And it's a letter that stands for TH. Uh, so the king of Tars. And we, you may think that the skin color in these illustrations these people shows to them is dark skinned. Uh, that is probably not, almost certainly not the original skin color of the text. Uh, I would have to go through the Ocean Lake manuscript and look at how skin color looks in other illustrations. And if it's dark all the way through, that would suggest to me that whatever pigment was being used to color this skin uh, would have maybe over the ensuing 600 years have taken on a different tone. So I'm going to guess this man is probably represents the Sultan of Damascus. 
and he probably was light-skinned in the original, but I'm not entirely sure. Actually, as I'm speaking, this is how you go through and you think about things. Uh, I notice actually that the sculpture of Jesus here, uh, the statue of Jesus crucified, shows him with light skin. Uh, light skin. So that actually gives the lie to everything I was just saying. Here we go. We have an example. Light skin, dark skin, salt of Damascus, dark skin, salt of Damascus. And then we can ask why the princess is also dark-skinned in this illustration. So I'm gonna leave that as a big question mark. I think that's super interesting, and it's something I've never really noticed before. At any rate, this is the King of Tars. Uh, here he is worshiping an idol, which is something we know that Muslims don't do. He's called a Saracen, but that's uh, a medieval English way of talking about Muslims. It's just a word that they use. Um, and has him worshiping an idol. Uh, it's very, very hard for medieval English Christians to admit that Muslims are in fact worship uh, a disembodied conception of God, uh, that in fact their notion of God is in some ways feels more pure than the Christian conception of God because theirs is of course extremely embodied. So they tend to represent Muslims as worshiping idols. They misrepresent, rep, misrepresent Muslim belief uh, to try to make themselves feel better about that religious difference. Okay, here we go. Same, same, same work, same beginning, different title. And we can ask what those two different titles mean. Okay, so the features, here's another manuscript of it. That's actually the same one. Uh, that's actually the boldly one. And you can see uh, what this looks like on the entire page. It's three columns, very closely written, really big manuscript. Uh, and you'd have to be pretty well trained in order to read this on the fly. Uh, Okay, so uh, features of a medieval text. It is um, based on, it's based on a uh, existing work that's very, very common in medieval textuality. Uh, we tend to want to believe that every writer invents things on their own. That's of course not the case, uh, but it's sort of uh, a lie we all choose to live by for copyright reasons. Uh, nobody in the Middle Ages believed that. Uh, so you take an existing story and you make slight modifications to it. And that persists, you know, of course, all the way through Shakespeare and there on there and so on into the present day. Uh, so it's based on an existing story. Uh, and as I told you, um, Tuesday and the existing versions of it, uh, prior ones, uh, the child is, is sometimes born part black, part white, sometimes it's born part animal, sometimes it's born hairy. Um, and in, in one version, it's born as a kind of undistinguished lump without features. And that's the version the King of, Middle English King of Tars is going to use. But Middle English King of Tars is going to add one more thing, which is it's going to talk about the skin color of the Sultan of Damascus and how that skin color moves from black to white when he becomes Christian. That's, in, that's unique to the Middle English version. It's a key change. So it does a lot of usual things in medieval texts. Uh, the kings, both the king of, of uh, Tars and the Sultan of Damascus, both shout. They're both very angry. Uh, that's really usual. They, each one of them seek advice, uh, one from his daughter and his court and his wife, another one from his advisors and courtiers. Um, and their relationship to that advice differs a little bit, but it's, you can see how medieval kingship would have worked. Is It's not just one person making all the decisions on their own. They do it in consultation with other members of their court. Uh, it also uses usual slurs. Muslims, this, this text calls Muslims hounds, which is a slur, or dogs. And it's a nasty pun on the name of the prophet, uh, which you can, you can do the math if you like on that. The Sultan, I want to say in the Middle English version, goes to war uh, because his advisors lie to him, the Christian king of Tars did not, in fact, insult the sultan. He, when he heard the sultan wanted to marry his daughter, he went to his. He thought, "I don't want this to happen." And then he goes to his daughter and says, "What would you like to do?" And she says, "I don't want to do this." And so then he tells the messengers, "This is not going to happen." Right? That's very interesting. And then the sultan's messengers go back to the sultan and say. He called you a hound, he insulted you, and he said he was going to go to war to prevent you, and then the sultan goes to war. So that's that's an interesting breakdown, maybe something we can talk about in class. Uh, for more on this, if you want to look at the way the consent is working in this, there's actually an entire dissertation on the topic from a couple of years ago by, uh, I was the fifth reader on this dissertation, I believe, uh, or a third, um, by Jennifer Albagini at the CUNY Graduate Center called Divided Loyalties, Family and Consent to Marriage in Late Middle English Literature, 1300-1500. Like most dissertations, it's probably available on ProQuest. You can just 
read it. Um, so you can actually get access to cutting edge re research in uh, medieval and all other kinds of studies. So do we know the Sultan's skin color yet in this text? No, we're 420 lines in. We've got no idea. We get some references to costume differences and references to religious differences, uh, but there's an absolutely no commentary yet on skin color. I think that's very interesting. Okay, two more, uh, two more, three more slides. Uh, we've got, this work is, we're reading is written in Middle English. Again, key things, pronounce everything. Vowels are pronounced more like those in modern Spanish or French or German, and they are like those pronounced in modern English. That, that change in vowels happens in the 15th century for reasons we don't fully understand yet. So it helps though to know that L-O-N-D uh, would be, is, is the word land in Middle English. How do we know that? Because L-A-N-D in Middle English would be pronounced with a short A. So it would be pronounced land, right? L-A-N-D in Middle English would be pronounced land. That means you can spell it L-O-N-D and get away with it because there is no fundamental right or wrong spelling for English because it's not the most important language. There is for Latin, but there's not for English. You just spell it like it sounds. And so knowing how the vowels are pronounced and uh, actually helps you recognize some of the words, okay? L-O-N-D, land, same as modern English, land. Um, okay, so finally, here's a stanza uh, with some word order uh, for talking about Middle English, and I'm going to read the Middle English very quickly. Uh, the king was in sorrow bunda, the queen swooned many a stonda for her daughter Dera. Knicks and ladies there him fond, and took him up whole and sound, and comfort him in fera. Thus the queen and the king lived in sorrow and care, mourning, great deal it was to Hera. Her care was ever elich new, him changed both heed and hue for sorrow and really chera. It's not great poetry, right? Um, that's fine. Uh, it tells the story well. So to help you understand what is, what's going on here, I've pulled out a list of six things that call attention to some of the syntactical and grammatical features of this. First, uh, we see sometimes that verbs follow the adjective and the preposition. The king was in sorrow bound. Modern English, we would say something like, the king was bound in sorrow. Sometimes the adjective follows the noun instead of preceding it like it does in modern English. The queen, see, uh, line 360, for her doctor dare, instead of for her daughter dear, instead of for, or for their daughter dear, instead of for their dear daughter. Um, pronouns that start with TH in modern English start with H in this one. TH is a feature of Northern English at this time. Starting with H is a feature of Southern English. So that tells you where this text was probably written and probably even composed um, by somebody who spoke a Southern version of the language. So when you see him, that's probably them. When you see her, it's probably there. So, uh, line 360, for their daughter, dear. Or line 361, knights and ladies, there them found. Them, H-E-M, H-E-M is a pronoun, them in modern English. So uh, objects sometimes precede the verb. Knights and ladies, there them found, instead of knights and ladies found them there. Uh, the object of the clause sometimes begins the clause. So we have in uh, line 366, great deal it was to hear, great sorrow it was to hear, instead of to hear it was great sorrow. That's what we would expect in modern English, uh, or it was great sorrow to hear it. Um, and sometimes forms that are, we, we encounter forms that are just much less familiar, that I don't have time to explain right now. So line, the last line, second to last line, him changed both heed and hua, them change it both in skin tone. Them change it both in skin tone. Heat and hue, just as a way of saying, talking about their skin. Um, them is the object pronoun. So it, something changed them. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit hard to understand. And there is a case where guesswork is going to get you pretty far until you start to become more familiar with some of these unusual grammatical constructions. Okay, so that might help you a little bit, but you're gonna be working in class today uh, collectively translating this text. Okay, 
finally, we're taking you back to the Ocean Link uh, manuscript from, from Edinburgh. Uh, what distinguishes this work from some modern forms of racialization? Well, there's absolutely nothing in this text about the Sultan of Damascus intelligence. Certainly, he loses his temper and rages. Kings do that, though. They always do that. Kings are angry people. They have a lot of power, and they get really frustrated when it's thwarted. So I don't think that says anything about the racialization of him. Similarly, there's nothing about relative degrees of civilization. Again, both the King of Tars and the Sultan of Damascus both lose their temper. They both get really mad, and they both feel their emotions extremely strongly. But there's nothing about, say, relative degrees of technology, relative degrees of sophistication, or relative degrees of costuming. In fact, it says, suggests that the costuming of the Muslims is, in fact, much fancier than that of the Christians. Um, there's still, however, a sense that bodies say something, that you can look at someone and that there's something visible on their body that says something about who they are in terms of belonging to a larger group and that those groups can be arranged hierarchically and it is better to be one group than another group. So as with the Stanhope Smith story, as with the story of Mémé Leblanc, this is a story that is about racial transformation. And like these other stories of racial transformation, it is one that assumes that light colored skin is better than dark colored skin. And so transformation tends to go in, in, in one direction and is a direction of improvement. And that direction is towards whiteness. And that is the thing I think that connects it most clearly to modern kinds of racialization. And that is all I have to say for you right now. I'm looking forward to.